Revelation 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell, or the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Here in Revelation chapter 6, we just came out of a, a series of events, uh, of pictures in heaven, if you would. Um, opportunities that John was given to go up and stand next to the throne. He heard a trumpet and a voice that called unto him. And in that vision, he saw a throne set before him. And he that was there... The Lord, we know, was to look upon as jasper and a sardine stone. And remember that there was that great emerald rainbow around about him. There was also these elders, and they were gathered together. And, and, and these beasts that, that went in and about them. And, and every single time that they prophesied, and every single time that they praised God, these elders would fall at their feet and fall at the Lord's feet and cast their stones, or cast their crowns before his throne. We saw also the sea of glass, and then those, again, awful-looking beasts standing before God. All around, there was this procession of over 100 million angels that were just worshiping and praising and shouting out to God, giving honor to Him and glory to Him with all the best types of words you can imagine. In about the fifth chapter, he began to... Uh, be brought into the picture as that great Savior. The Bible said that He hath prevailed to open the seals. If you remember last week, we talked about how when John looked upon this book that was in the right hand of Him that sat upon the throne, he was in great, in great mourning and great woe, and he cried out and said, Who is worthy? There's no one in heaven or on earth or beneath the earth even that can open this. And that was when Jesus stepped in. That was when the Lamb entered the scene. And it said, He hath prevailed to open the seals. He hath overcome to open the seals. And that chapter finishes out with more praise and more glory and more honor given unto Him at that time. And all of that was to bring us to the point where we're now here. The stage is set. The Lamb is now entering in to do what He said He would accomplish. And that is to open the seals and to loose what is contained in that book. 
In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1 it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Now, I'm thinking that this is the type of thunder that you hear quite often way off in the distance. It's not the crack that happens right beside you, but it's more that, that low, deep rumble, come and see, come and see. That's, that's kind of what I vision. I actually was playing on YouTube a whole bunch of different types of thunder. They have these meditation or these, or these relaxing videos that you can either sleep to or, or whatever. Anyways, I was just listening to thunder and over and over and over. What I envision is that deep rumbling voice that almost shakes you to the core. Come and see as this seal is open. He talks then specifically here about each of these four beasts that were mentioned in the previous chapters. It says, one of the four beasts says, come and see. And I'm thinking that the Bible, as it often does, if it's going to give you a group of people or a group of beings or a group of things, when it refers to them again, God is always careful to keep that same order of things. So therefore, I believe that when it says the one of the four beasts says something. The one of the four beasts that it was referring to, if you were to look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7, you'll see the list of them. It says the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. I believe that the first four seals are going to go in that same proper order given in the Bible. The first is going to be the beast like a lion, the second the calf, the third the man, and the last is the flying eagle. And you'll see, and we'll only talk about these first four seals, and how these different beasts were actually an indication of what type of events happened or transpired when the seal was opened. Now, the seal, what it is, and I remember I've given this illustration before, a seal is basically just a containment. It's, just, it's basically just a block to something that is behind it. Remember, if this was the water bottle and this was the seal, when I open the seal, what comes out? Exactly what was contained behind it. It was already there. It was already present. It was just withheld for a time until that seal was opened. In the same way, whatever is going to be revealed in each one of these seal events was already there. It was already present. Maybe it was withheld. Maybe it was contained in some way. But it, it was something that was already existing at the time. It was simply that Jesus stepped in, opened the seal, and whatever transpired, whatever was in and behind the seal, just busted forth. And that's what we see here. So whatever is behind it is already there. It's just being released. What I'm pointing out is that it's not going to be some strange new thing. It's going to be something that we all know very well. We've seen very well. Just like this, we all understand what water is. When the seal comes off, we expect that water would come forth. And that's what I think that this chapter of the Bible is indicating, is the same thing. They're very natural, very normal things for us that are kept behind a certain seal. And when they're released, yes, they do happen in an exponentially larger rate than what we're used to. But all the same, it, it's the same type of thing that we know and are familiar with. So in verse 2 there in Revelation chapter 6, it says, And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And that's what I mean there. We all are familiar with what a horse is. We know what a bow is, we know what a crown is, and we know what conquering indicates. So that was what was released with this first seal. So who is this white horse? That question is often made. A lot of people say, well, that's Jesus coming in the clouds, and that's going to be that, that great rapture before all of these really bad events transpire. But not so quick. We can't be so quick, because remember, it was the Lamb himself that opened the seal in the first place. Why would he need to open a seal to let himself out? That would be my first question. But I want to actually dive into each one of these events and look at the characters involved. They may be prophetic in a picture of something that, that, is, that is going to play out in a different way. I'm not certain. I don't know that we'll actually see a horse, we'll actually see a boat. But John is in heaven, remember? And whatever he sees in heaven, he's writing about now. It may manifest itself differently to us, but we can take different characteristics of what we see and we can apply them unto our experience here and we can learn something. That's what I'm going to try to do here. So with the white horse, white, it's clean, right? It's, it's something that, that is un, unspotted. It's completely, completely blank. It's a blank slate. White is, is given as an indication of something that is clean. But this is actually just an appearance. It's just something that, that looks clean. Because we know if we were to go to Leviticus chapter 11, I won't take you there, and in verse 3, it talks about how the, un, or the clean beasts have to be both cloven-footed and chew the cud. This is why it's okay for us to eat horse or eat cows, 
right? Because they're, they're cloven footed, right? This is how they walk and they're chewing their cud. They got those three stomachs that they're constantly regurgitating and re-eating, sending it to the next one. So they are considered a clean beast unto us and according to the Old Testament dietary restrictions. And so the horse, while it looks clean because it is white and fresh and, and, and unspotted, it is actually an unclean thing that is being riding in here at this time. So keep that in mind. The white horse is not clean as it would appear. Now it says that he that sat upon the horse, he that sat on him had a bow, okay? So if you would, turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 6 or a bookmark or whatever you have. And as you do turn to Genesis chapter 9, remember we're talking about the bow. Let me read for you Hosea 1 and verse 7. It says, I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horses or by horsemen. Okay, so God is indicating that when he comes to save Judah by the Lord their God, he's not going to do it by the bow. He's not going to do it by the horse. He's not going to do it by horsemen going into battle. Okay, God does have a bow. And I'm going to read that in Genesis chapter 9 and in verse 13. Genesis 9 and verse 13, the Bible says, I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I rem may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So back in Revelation chapter 6, we find the rider of the white horse has a bow, but he is using it to conquer. God's bow is the rainbow. This is the bow that Caleb called out the other day when he saw it going across the sky with all of its glorious colors. The rainbow is God's bow. And the more you look up the bow in the Bible, the more you find that God does not use a bow in any other situation. Very rarely will you find God's arrows shooting into somebody and it's usually in a case like Job where somebody like Job is mourning They're at a loss and they're saying the Almighty has smitten me with an arrow Okay, they're saying that but that's not necessarily true. You don't find God coming at people with a bow his bow He set it down. He left it alone in the cloud and it's there as a reminder of a covenant that he has with all men as an indication of the fact that he will never again flood the earth. That's a promise that God took the bow and set it in the cloud. God's not using that bow to fire darts at people. But we know somebody that is using fiery darts, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, if you were to go there, it says, Put on the shield of faith, wherewith you, be, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And we know very well and very clearly, go through the Psalms. David was constantly talking about the wicked hitting them with their darts, firing at them with their arrows, shooting them, bending their bow. They've shot their arrows, even bitter words, the Bible says. And here we see, we see that the shield of faith is something that the Christian dons, and it's not to keep God's arrows off them. It's to keep the fiery darts of the wicked off them. And so I see, again, another case where, yes, maybe you might have thought it's not such a good point that the white horse is actually an unclean beast. But here we see that he has a bow. The rider has a bow. And that's not God. That's not Jesus Christ. He, doesn't, he does not use the bow. He set his bow down in the cloud. The Bible says a crown was given unto him. Back to Revelation chapter 2, or Revelation 6 and verse 2. It says, a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Again, I don't believe that my Lord needs to be given a crown. He is crowned with many crowns, past tense. He's already crowned. He does not need one to be given him, nor does he need to go forth conquering as this rider of the white horse does. Matthew chapter 28, after his resurrection, after some time with his disciples, right before his ascension into heaven, he said these words. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
God, Jesus, has all power. He does not need a crown to be given him. He does not need this authority and power to be given him. He has it. He received it at that time. And he was crowned. The only reason he needed to receive it back in Matthew chapter 28 to make that statement was because he willingly laid down the crown in order that he could come and be that sinless, spotless Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, go to that cross, find redemption for all of us, bring it back up to heaven, and just take his proper seat back with that crown on him. He did not need it to be given unto him, nor did he need to go forth conquering anything. So like I said, I don't believe that this first white horse, this first seal that was released here, was Jesus. Maybe it was someone that is like Jesus. Maybe it is another Jesus. Maybe it is the very Antichrist, but it's not my Jesus. Now, if you look and see, you'll see that the lion was indicated as that first beast that was, that was involved in the opening of that crown. That first beast was the lion. And that is where you see the lion often crowned and, and talked about as the king of the jungle, right? The lion is typified as a king, as a royal of the beast. Now, if you go to verse 3, we're going to continue on. It says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. The second beast, according to Revelation 4 and verse 7, is like a calf. Okay? And this calf... I often think about it as something, you know, how calves often are. They're always button heads. They have horns in their heads because they're just going to, they're going to knock them together. That's how they're going to push around. That's how they're going to make their way. That's how they're going to find their position within the ranks of their herd. They're always seeing red. They're always pushing with their heads, okay? In verse 4 it says, And there went out another horse that was red. There it is. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So here, peace is taken. Power is given unto this to take peace from the earth. And we know it's so easy in the day that we live in, that peace comes and peace goes. And quite often, the second that peace is removed from a population, immediately murder starts taking place. Immediately theft, robbery, wickedness. Peace is something where once, it's kind of like in a balance. It's kind of like this very, very uh, sensitive thing. And as soon as the balances shift and peace just drops off, immediately men's carnal nature just takes over and they always want what there is, is their own. And they're willing to steal, to cheat, and to murder to get what they want. And that's what it talks about here in, in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. It said, the horse was red, and power was given him to take peace from the earth. And as soon as he took peace from the earth, wouldn't you know it, you see more red. Why? Because they're killing one another. There's a great sword given to the rider of the horse, red horse. Death is happening everywhere. There's blood flowing in the streets because men cannot be satisfied with what they have, and so they're always going to just knock heads, butt heads one with another, and you're going to see bloodshed as soon as peace is removed from a population. On the other hand, Jesus, he is the prince of peace, right? Jesus brings peace everywhere he goes. Now, I will say that Jesus came the first time not to bring peace but a sword, and that is true. But what you don't find when Jesus brings the sword is his own wielding it, okay? Quite often it's a one-way break in the peace, right? The Christian receives the Prince of Peace. In that moment, they do great peace. That passive understanding overwhelms their hearts. Then they go back to their family, and suddenly that's where the enmity comes from. That's where the enemies are found. The unbelievers have broken peace with the ones that has found the peace of Jesus Christ. And so it's not the same as is indicated here in Revelation where peace is removed and one another are killing each other. Rather, when peace is taken, or when peace is taken in this case, in the believer's life by Jesus when he comes, it's only because he has found peace and others are just not satisfied therewith. They're not happy with it. And so that sword comes, as the Bible says, there is given him a sword. And the sword of this world 
is one that always brings death. It's meant to cut. It's meant to kill. It's meant to destroy. But the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, does the opposite. It doesn't bring death, does it? It brings life unto those that receive it. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is the life of anyone who should believe it and receive it and keep it as their own. That is life unto them. So there we see again why I can't believe that what is happening here is God's doing. God released the seal. God let it happen. God allowed for these things to transpire, but he did not contribute to them. He did not make them happen. These weren't fashioned of his own ideas. Next, if you would, continue reading down in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 5. It says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld in lo a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. So here we see the black horse. That third beast in Revelation 4 and verse 7 was the one that had the face as a man. And when you see blackness, I often think about the darkness of men's hearts. The, the, the evil that men brought into this world when they had sin. The unrighteousness, the, 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 the wickedness involved in mankind. And so it's, it's interesting that it's typified then by that third beast with the face of a man. The Bible says that he was a black horse and he had a pair of balances in his hand. Keep your finger where you're at and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. And back there in Deuteronomy 25, you're going to find um, the thing that is, is interesting is that with balances, there's nothing necessarily wrong with them, okay? A balance is simply a device to measure, to weigh something. So you, you put weights on the one side, and then you put your item on the other side, and as you add more weights, this might be so foreign and archaic to some of these children, right? But a balance is basically this. You have two completely balanced and even sides of the scale, right? Okay, now let's just say I wanted to weigh my book. I put my book on there, and immediately the scale is going to do this, right? So if I want to find out how much this book weighs, I take these little weights, okay, and, and they come in very small increments, but they're, they're finely, precisely fashioned. So whatever that weight says on it is exactly how much that weight weighs. And so when the balance is sitting like this, and then I take a weight and I drop it, it may, it may bounce like this for a second, but then return back that. So I take another weight and I drop it. It may go like this, but it's going to go back. And eventually I'm going to add enough weights to where my book and the weights come up and they find balance. And then all I do is I count how many weights I put on it, and I know exactly how much the book weighs. Does that make sense? So that is how weights and balances work. So this beast had the black horse, the man on the black horse, had a pair of balances in his hand. So again, there's nothing wrong with these. They were quite often the, the, mo the best way to actually um, measure things and to get proper amounts. When we used to go to the grocery store, we actually used to take our items put them on the scale and we do that in order to figure out how much of a certain item you're buying. Now you just drag it along the thing and it just goes ding and it tells you, right? It just, it just knows how much it weighs and we've gotten digitized. But the Bible's talking about these and again they're not necessarily bad things, but go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 13. The Bible says, and this is a command that God made and he had to make this command. Why? Because usually when he commands something it's because our natural inclination is to do the opposite. Okay, verse 13 says, Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thy house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. A perfect and just measure shalt thou have. That, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So what was happening here and what God was commanding against was that if I was going to weigh this book because you're going to buy it at $5 a pound and I take my weight that says one pound but it is actually a half a pound and then I drop it on there and then I drop another one on there, when it comes up, I'm now getting twice from you than what I should have because my weights were wrong. That's why God says, don't have diverse weights. In other words, I'm going to use this weight for my friend and this weight for my enemy. Don't do that, because if you do, you're not going to dwell long in the land that you are given. right? And so this is another indication, and you can go back to Revelation, that shows me that it's, you know, glory to God, it's a good alignment that the beast that announced this 
was the one with the face of a man, because this is exactly what men do. He has this balance in his hand, but I believe he was doing exactly what we saw. He was an unjust judge. He had unjust weights. He had unjust measures, just like mankind always try to do, right? You're always going to go to the store and you're going to get ripped off. You're going to get taxed upon taxed upon taxed. There's unjust measures in the world that we are living in. And the end result is just as God promised. You will not dwell long in the land if you're going to run your society like this. And so here, the Bible says, and we see this in the scriptures, right in the context, I didn't have to make this up, that there was unjustness happening. There was an unbalance happening. And it says in verse 6, Revelation 6 and verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So there in that scripture you see that a measure of wheat and a measure of barley are both being sold for a penny. And everyone's like, well, wow, that's a great deal. That's fantastic. But according to the Bible, and if you were to turn over, you don't have to, to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 2, and there's a whole story about this. It shows that a general laborer in the time of the Bible received a penny a day. So what the Bible is saying is that at the time that this seal is open, when that voice is crying out and saying, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, that means that you have to go to work for a whole entire day just to bring back a measure of wheat. And do you know what you do with wheat? You add water to it, and then you get a little bit of bread. Could you imagine if your parents had to go to work for an entire day just to get a little piece of bread for you to all share. This is what is referred to as famine. This is what has been seen throughout our history time and time again, when unjust weights and balances are practiced in a civilization. And you can see the unjustness in the weights and balance when that Bible verse continues at the end and it says, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine, okay? What was hurt was the daily need, the bread, the barley, the stuff that people survived on just daily food to get into their stomachs, to have the energy to go back to work, to have just enough money to get just enough food to go back to work. They were trapped in this, but the Bible says here, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The barley, the daily need is hurt, but the oil and the wine, the finer things, the fancier things, the, the delicacies, they were not hurt at this time. And what is that is indicating is that there was an unbalance, meaning that the people that were very rich, they still had their delicacies. They still had their finer things. They were actually more than abundant. There was plenty of them. And then we see in the context of what's happening here in the third seal is that greed of men, selfishness of men, is going to reach a tipping point. It's already there. It's already present. It's all in men's hearts. But God's going to do what? He's going to open that seal, and it's just going to reach the point where now your average Joe is starving. It's it, you would you would be famished. I mean, we all go home, and for the most part, we have good meals, three square meals a day. Could you imagine working for a whole day only to come back and basically get a little bit of a snack? before you go to bed and have to do it again. This is what the Bible is talking about in the times of this third seal, when the black horse comes with those balances that are imbalanced appropriately, inappropriately toward the rich people. They're, fair, they're cherishing and favoring the rich people at this time. Continue on into verse 7. Verse 7. The Bible says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. So the fourth beast, according to Revelation 4, verse 7, is the flying eagle. Okay, it's a flying eagle. And in verse 8 it says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Okay? So here we see that pale horse, and it would, it would make sense if this was chronologically correct, that, that the pale horse would follow after what we just saw with the black horse. Because paleness has to do with being weak, being sick, being, being famished, malnutrition, being feeble. Whenever somebody is pale and they walk into the room, you're like, whoa, you don't look very well. You look sick. What's wrong with you? And so when this horse enters in pale, we see 
we see that indication that there is something lacking in it. It is sickly. It is, it is not very well. And so when the voice says, come and see, what follows after is death. Okay? Whenever a nation is starving, whenever people are starving, you could not go on very long working tirelessly in order to get just enough food. Eventually you're going to wear out and what's going to happen is sickness and death. And the Bible records also that death was the one that sat on the throne and hell followed with him. Okay, And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. So what's happening here is that death arrives on the heels of this great famine. And, and the, the power struggle that's going on where the rich are getting richer and the poor are falling into contempt and starvation. And on the heels of this, death enters into the scenario and hell falls with them. So the Bible records that one-fourth of the earth will be given unto death and hell's dominion and their power. Okay, So I have held that this, and it still indicates to me, that this is a scenario where the whole of the earth is there. Okay, So one-fourth part of the earth, and I say that quite often... I believe that Christians will be involved in these scenarios. They will be taking part. Believers will be taking part in them because I've already said that Revelation chapter 4 couldn't be the rapture. We couldn't disappear there. I've already said that here, Revelation 6 chapter 2 couldn't be. It doesn't show any indication that it's Jesus Christ coming to take his saints away. So here Christians are experiencing that. Don't let the fact that it says hell is following with them scare you or worry you. The, the reality is, is that one quarter of the earth is partaking in this scenario and is subject to the death that is coming. And there is no way that one-fourth part of the earth is entirely Christian. And so as people are dying and as people are suffering and as people are falling, believers and unbelievers alike are going to fall into condemnation. And surely hell is going to be there waiting to grab a hold and to suck in anyone they will. But glory to God, some save with fear, others pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Hey, death can come. Great, that's fine. Glory to God, absent from the body, present with the Lord, because as soon as it does for the believer, it doesn't matter that hell is following with to grab up the dead, to grab up the dead, and to, to bring them and draw them into himself. It doesn't matter because Jesus Christ is waiting there to scoop you away. And there will be your rapture. There will be your moment of salvation. There will be your moment that, uh, where, where you will finally look upon him even as he has, you'll see him as he is because you'll be glorified. You'll be, you'll be raised anew. You'll be saved. Death may take a hold of the believer, but we like that saying where it says, if you're born once, you'll die twice, right? Death, then hell. But if you're born twice, you're only going to die once. Death will get you. Hell will not get you. But here in Revelation chapter 6 and in verse 8, it says, Power was given to death and hell over one-fourth part of the earth. And what happened was they were killed with sword, with death, with hunger, and with beasts. Okay? So these are all indications of what you would see at a scenario like this. Remember that we saw a great war. We saw peace removed from the earth. And it followed by starvation. People that are just tirelessly laboring in order to get one meal. One not even square meal. Just enough bread to fill their belly. And so the sword enters in as death comes on the scene. The just death in general, perhaps from starvation, enters in. The hunger that people are feeling when they just can't get enough and they die and they just, they just famish and waste away. And then the beasts of the field that also take people. In times of great famine and starvation, you'll be surprised to see how the whole world is going to be affected. You're going to see first, yes, us starving and us in trouble. People are going to come out with swords, as the Bible says, when death enters in. They're going to, they're going to try to steal that guy's daily bread, that guy's provision, what he worked for in order so that they get more for themselves. But then you also see just death takes hold, hunger takes hold, and the beasts of the field will suffer and know the same. Isn't it true that we give a little bit extra? You know, I just went to the store this morning because our dog was out of food, right? So I went and I got some extra food to give to the dog. Now ours is just like a little rat looking thing. But the reality is there's a lot of big dogs, a lot of big animals out there that people are, people are feeding. You think people are still going to be feeding them when you go to work for a whole day and you only get a little bit of bread? No. So these beasts are going to turn and rend us, okay? It won't just be like 
Fido that's sitting at home, but there's also going to be wild beasts that are starving, that have lack. Think of all the think of all the uh, the raccoons in this city that just are constantly going, and they're just they're just peeling apart our garbage when there's nothing there because men are consuming it all. These animals are going to starve too, and do you know what they're going to do? They're going to look at a weak and feeble and pale human and think, hey, that looks like a good snack. And so the Bible is recording that at this time in the end days. Death and hell are going to come, and one-fourth of the world is going to suffer by the sword, is going to suffer by death, is going to suffer by hunger, is going to suffer by beasts, okay? The one thing that I like about this is the interesting part is there you have the eagle. Now, one thing about an eagle is they fly higher than most every bird, right? So they're going to oversee this. They're going to see it just like death and hell were given power over the death that is going to transpire. The eagle also, as the beast that announced it coming, is going to oversee this. We'll see lots of people indiscriminately fall, but I believe at this time there's going to be a focus in on the saved, okay? I believe that Christians are going to be the first to suffer by the sword and by death and by hunger. Why? Because the Bible records there's going to be a time when we're not even going to be able to buy and sell, say, if he that has the mark of the beast and the number of his name. And that's not going to be something that just starts like here. There's probably going to come a little bit of a time where men's idea about Christians and what they what they feel about them is going to change. Christians are going to have a harder time finding jobs. Christians are going to have a harder time paying the bills, a harder time interacting with society before we get to the point where there's going to be a decision made to take a mark in your right hand and in your forehead. And so what I believe is that at this time, much of the focus is going to be on particularly persecuting Christians. And if you look back in history, it's happened many a times where the woes of a society, Romans, where the woes of a society in Britain have been blamed upon the believers. And so men in, in unity joined against the Christians and said, yeah, you're right, it's the Christians' fault. It's the Christians' fault. And godless Heathen governments have blamed Christians for the woes of society. And so I think there's going to be a persecution that escalates at this fourth seal. And one of the main reasons that I believe that is if you were to just look quickly in verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw into the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Right? So remember, we're looking at these scenarios chronologically as they play out. As John saw them and as we'll experience them here on this earth and immediately following the great... Um, the great famine, immediately following death and hell entering into, we find there in heaven souls that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony that they held. And that, that indicates to me, while we won't get too much into the fifth seal, that what's happening here, also indicated by the eagle that is there, is that there were Christians that had a testimony. There were Christians that had the word of God. There were Christians that were just walking through these same difficulties with faith, and I believe they were doing great exploits at that time. And so we need to take what we learn from a scenario like this, keep them in our heart, and if we see these things coming to pass, know how to react when each one of these events comes. So the conclusion that I have made is that it is the Lamb, and you see that in verse 1, that opened the seals. So Jesus, the Lamb slain from the foundation, opened the seals, which allowed for the events to transpire, men-centered events, things that we already see in this world, though they're not as bad as they're portrayed here. We see these events happening, hurt and harm that was previously restrained is now released, by God into this world. So God allows it, but I don't believe God caused it. It's earthly, original, it's, it's created in the earth, it just reaches a tipping point to where it's actually causing great harm and great suffering and great famine, and one-fourth of the earth is dying even after those that have already died by the plagues, even after those that have already died when peace was removed and people were killing one another. Just, just a time of great death, and I don't believe God is the author of, though he has in his, in his, in his wonderful understanding of all things, he has ordained and allowed for it to take place. So what we can do is we can learn and we can watch for these things to happen and we can try to apply these things when they do happen because the days are just getting worse and worse and worse. People are deceiving and being deceived. It's just going to get even worse for our society right now. We can pray. We can try to get people saved. We can try our best one by one, one door after a time, one, one person at a time to try to turn the tides of things. But it seems like we've kind of got to a breaking point, especially in our nation, where things just aren't going to get turned around by the hundreds that we get saved through this church and other like-minded churches. 
But we can learn something. So the first step we see was the lion, right? So what we need to do, if you were to look in verse 2, we need to watch for, okay, watch for conquerors that receive a crown as a gift. So when you see the great political leaders stand up and they're conquerors, and one of them comes and he's just given this crown. He's given more dominion, more power than you could ever expect or imagine some man would be given. We know that the president of the USA has a ton of power. But imagine something even greater. Imagine a conqueror. Imagine a, a crown being placed on a man like, like Donald Trump. But his power then just explodes into something beyond that. Because he starts conquering and conquering and conquering and taking dominion of that. We can watch for that and we can see and say, hey, maybe in heaven that seal's been broken. That seal's been opened and that white horse is now charging forward. The next thing that we can learn and we can watch for from these first four seals is that the second was a calf, right? The talk was about always butting heads, always fighting, always, always trying to press against others. We know that each one of us, if we've been believed and we've been saved by Jesus Christ, has that peace that passeth all understanding, but we know that there is a pride in man that is the foundation of all contention. And so don't be like men. We gotta be humble because when peace is taken from the world, you better believe that men are gonna come at you with their pride and they're gonna bump against you. They're gonna butt heads with you. They're gonna fight with you. They're gonna argue with you. But we need to be as Christians humble enough to just let our enemy have their way. That's fine. Okay, whatever. You're gonna you're gonna be arrogant, you're gonna be proud, you're going to fight. Well, it takes two to tango, so there's gonna be no fight here. So we need to not be proud, but be humble when peace is removed from a situation or removed from the world entirely, as the context shows. The third is the one of men, and we know that bread is precious, and quite often when daily bread is precious, the most best things are, are, are everywhere to be found, okay? So what, what that is indicating, and if you were to study, I think, the, the like Russian system, is that basically when communism broke and split open, a lot of really rich and wealthy families got a hold of commercial items and what we have here, and they basically just started buy, buying up everything. And so once the free society were broken, a lot of super rich people took their slice and then had controls. I think it's... Is it the oligarchs or something like that? I, I forget the term. I, I looked into it a little bit more before. But yeah, so basically a bunch of rich people took the opportunity where communism didn't exist anymore to just get super rich. They just started buying up everything all at once. So you have very few that have a lot of everything. And so bread then still became very precious because it didn't turn around for your average Joe to be able to start to you know buy the bigger things, have a nicer this, have a nicer that, eat more food. No, they actually did the opposite for a while. For a long while, they became very poor, and I think a lot of them are still suffering in, the, in that same state. So the rich got richer, the poor got poorer as soon as that system broke in. And the best things, while they were, while they were precious in the eyes of the minority, for the people that had them, they had plenty. The best things were plenteous. The bread then was precious. And so we need to understand that we need to put our trust and our desires and our hearts on things that aren't of this world. Because when men find themselves in that scenario, like the third seal, where there's the measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, and we don't have two nickels to rub together, and we're broke and we can't provide for our family, that's where our faith needs to not be put upon the job, put upon the bread, put upon our neighbor, put upon things in this earth. We need to put our faith and our trust in Jesus because at that time, more than ever, we're going to realize that psalm come to truth where it says, I have never seen his seed nor the righteous begging bread. God will never allow for his own people to be begging for bread. They will always have enough to satisfy them, always have enough to keep themselves full. The next you see is that when death and hell come, that fourth eagle comes in, I believe that this is going to be the opportunity that we read about back in Ezekiel, back in Daniel, where men are going to do exploits, where Christians and believers are going to do great exploits. So death comes in, persecution comes in, hey, now it's time Christians to get some people saved. Get out there, get soul winning. The Bible says in verse 9 that those that followed on the heels of death and hell coming in, the great fourth part of the world dying with sword and with death and with beasts of the earth and with hunger, 
Right after that, you're going to find that those that have the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ are going to be standing at the altar saying, How long, O Lord? How long will thou wait and not judge those that dwell upon the earth? And the response was from him, until the time when the others, your brethren that likewise, shall suffer the same things as you. Paraphrase that. But that is the indication to me that when death and hell, when all of these woes come to be, when we start to see these signs coming to be, that's when Christians, as things get worse and worse and worse and worse in the world, Christians need to get better and better and better and better and better and soar just like these eagles. Just like the beast that came and announced that coming judgment. Just like the beast that showed up and said, hey, this is the opening of the fourth seal. Come and see it. At that same time, you're going to just see escalation of Christians, real Christians, blood-bought Christians that love the lost, that love other people, that want to see people saved and join them in heaven, do great exploits, the greatest exploits that you've ever seen in the face of the earth, soaring as eagles. And I believe that's what brings the great tipping point where they just start saying, hey, we got to get rid of these Christians. All they're doing is preaching. They're getting bread from who knows where. Their God is supplying all of their need. They're not even going to work anymore. They're just getting people saved. They're just having fellowship. They're breaking bread one with another. God's providing for them, and that tipping point will come to where they're just going to say, you know what, that's it. we got to kill them all. Okay? And so that's what's going to happen. That's what's unfolding in these first chapters, uh, or in these first seals that are uh, being explained in Revelation chapter 6. And I believe, again, that they are very earthly focused. It's simply God is unleashing these things and allowing them to happen. But it sounds scary. It sounds frightening. But when you look at the reality of what Christians will be doing, the potential that we have to do wondrous things for God at that time, to see people saved, to see perhaps miracles happening, perhaps like you saw in the prophets where like, you know, they were praying and fire was coming down and destroying their enemies. Who knows? Like when you read the Bible, you're like, man, these things are, these things are unbelievable that the prophets were doing. But we can be prophets just by proclaiming the word of God. And who knows what God has reserved for us when he calls it great exploits. Those that love the Lord will do great exploits. Who knows? Who can even imagine the types of things that God's referring to? So, so be encouraged. Don't, don't let these things scare you. I mean, this is just God giving us his plan. And that's all he said. He said, Before, behold, I told you before. And you know why he told us before? That you would not fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be worried. Don't be concerned. Just learn from these, just as we did today. We took the first, second, third, fourth seal, and we just applied them to our lives and saw what God might be showing us through these so that when these things happen, we won't be scared. We'll just trust him. Hey, it is written. I already knew this was going to happen. Okay, what do I have to do? We can just open the book and follow it. Thank you, Father, for this day, Lord. Um,